I'm Timothy West, and this is my wife, Brunella Scales. We're celebrating our golden wedding this year. Yeah, 50 years. <laughs> Feels more like 14. I know. We might be known as actors. That's all. But when we're not treading the boards, it's all hands on deck. Cast off, please. Aye, sir. We're canal nuts, and we've been pottering around on them nearly all our married life. But we're both getting on a bit now. I'm going to need some help. And since we're celebrating 50 years of wedded bliss... Yes. Yes. We are determined to make the most of what we love, whilst we still can. Prue has a slight condition. It's very mild, but it does mean she has difficulty remembering things. Oh, Tim! I'm so sorry. I didn't cast you off. Well, it can be a nuisance sometimes, but it doesn't stop me remembering how to open a locked gate or make the skipper a cup of tea. We're going to be revisiting two canals that we know and love. We're at the summit! Hooray! And two canals that are new to us. Wow, that's astonishing. Oh. It won't all be plain sailing. Tim! What's the matter? <laughs> we'll be braving the great British summertime. I'm so cute and some of the most challenging routes on the network. That is a bit scary. Canals reveal a hidden world. Yes, little light at the end of the tunnel. Each canal is different, but they all offer this wonderful antidote to the hurry and bustle of modern life. You can't rush on the canal. On this week's journey, we're going back to where we had our honeymoon, the picturesque town of St. Gotland in North Wales. Fifty years ago, we drove there, but our return journey will be far more romantic. Especially as to get there, we'll need to cross the longest and highest aqueduct in Britain. Tim loves it, but I'll have my heart in my mouth the whole way. We'll also take a detour down the remote and only partially restored Montgomery Canal. Yes, that's a real haven for plant and wildlife. I can't wait. And when we reach our final destination, Tim will get to indulge one of his other passions, steam trains. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Our journey begins in Shropshire, near the town of Ellesmere, where we're picking up our hire boat. Right. Okay. On you go. It's all right. unlocked. Okay. Oh, look, galley. Wow. Yes, nice galley. Yes. Nice and big. They've stopped mm -hmm. the fridge for us. Yes. That's very kind. Lovely. Uh, oh, nice microwave. Yes. I've never had a microwave yeah, on board before. Okay. <laughs> okay. The canal starts in the West Midlands, crosses from England into Wales, and then follows the course of the River Dee to the town of Flangotlan. Lots of canal boats, yes. It's a very popular, very popular canal. And it hasn't changed much in, I suppose, since um, 1805. I don't and, know. Uh, You're much better on this than I am. Uh, it's an incredible piece of engineering. There's, um, the world famous Ponca Sister Aqueduct. The what? Ponca Sister Aqueduct. Ponca Sister. Was that it? Getting there. Getting there. <laughs> Try again after lunch. Off we go. England this way, Wales that way. Starting out on the Llangollen Canal, we'll briefly detour down the less travelled Montgomery. Heading north again, we'll pass through the gorgeous Shropshire countryside, and at Chirk, we'll cross the border into Wales, and then it's the famous Poncasista Aqueduct, before we wend our way towards the head of the canal. You can't have canals without a good supply of water, and for the Llangollen, the best source was in the foothills of Snowdonia, so consequently the route takes in some dramatically beautiful scenery. Quite a long time ago there was tourism. Sangolfen was a very keen tourist place. 
in Victorian times. And uh, so there was quite a lot of traffic on the canal. The hire boats were different back then, with a skipper and a crew. There were other cargoes as well, wool, limestone and, of course, Welsh coal. With the arrival of the railways, the canal went into decline, but since its revival in the 1960s, this scenic route has become world famous. This journey to the town of Llangollen is very personal to us. Fifty years ago, we spent our honeymoon there, and in the year of our golden wedding anniversary, I can't help thinking about those early days of our courtship, when we were both young actors. I met Tim. <gasps> I remember in a terrible, terrible play called She Died Young. Uh, we had a sort of mild times crossword flirtation during the rehearsals, and he said, would like to come to the pictures? So I said, yeah, I'd love to. And uh, we went to the pictures and went our separate ways home. And uh, eventually, he and I started going out together, as it were, and um, then we got married, and we've had two smashing kids. He never bores me. When he talk, talks about things, it's always, it's always interesting or entertaining. I don't know, we, we, we just fit somehow. Well, it was a beautiful start this morning, but the sky's getting a bit black. We knew it would. Well, let's hope the storm holds off at least until we're safely moored up this evening. We're coming up to Franklin Junction now. Time to get busy as we've got a flight of locks to negotiate. Which side do you want to drop me? Uh, I'll drop, it, drop you there. Yeah. We're making a short detour, coming off the Langotlin Canal and onto the Montgomery, to explore one of the wildest parts of the network. We're locking down now. I think it's um, a sequence of, of three locks, as far as I remember. Locking down means going downwards with less water at the end of each lock. You have to be very vigilant. If you're moored too far back in the lock, as the water level sinks, you'll end up with your stern snagged on the lock's sill and the bow sinking into the remaining water. Of the many potential hazards in canal boating, this is one you really want to avoid. It has happened to us once. You see here it says, keep boat forward of sill marker. And there's the sill where, where, it's, where it's marked. Um, and uh, it has led act to real accidents and in, in, in one occasion, fatalities. Prue might have all the hard work, but the responsibility of keeping us afloat rests with me. Prue's motioning me back, but not that far. That doesn't look much, but if you're way back against the gates, then you're absolutely buggered with it. It's a nice picture there of what can happen. For safety reasons, these locks can only be operated under the supervision of the lock keeper. On a flight like this, it's easy to lose your concentration with potentially disastrous results. This boat has got a specially extended fender on the back, which is supposed to stop you making that mistake. I wouldn't trust it. Eventually we make it safely down the flight and out into open water. We're now officially on the Montgomery Canal, or the Monty as it's known. The Monte was used to transport limestone into this rich agricultural area. Heated in canal-side kilns and spread on the fields as quicklime, it was an early form of fertilizer. The canal never made any money, but in recent years, it's become a haven for nature, which is why I've always wanted to come here. Hold it, but don't pull. What? Hold it, but don't pull. We're mooring up because the section of canal we're going to explore next has not yet been restored, 
and has become so overgrown that it's only accessible on foot. No boats have passed along this stretch of canal for 75 years, so nature has completely taken over and created a unique habitat found nowhere else in the world. Hello. Hello there. You must be Stuart. Here to guide us through the reserve is the Canal and River Trust's leading naturalist, Stuart Moody. This is the canal? It is the canal, yes. Mm. But it has got a, an incredibly beautiful, um, uh, uh, very important and unique ecology. You can look down through the, the column of the water. It's almost lo looking through a, a rainforest from the canopy because you've got all the plants growing up through the water. And mm. the water's so clear that you can see all the way to it the bottom. It is wonderful. It is, isn't it? And then yes. on the bottom you get water snails and things like freshwater crayfish, and they all live on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And they've, they're all part of this really, really special ecology. You get otters? Yes, we do. And um, uh, they're one of the reasons that the canal is protected. It's one of our success stories. Otters have spread from um, almost extinction in the 1960s, and now they're, they're, they're almost um, in every county in, in England. Leading us further into the reserve, we cross onto the aqueduct that was built to take the canal across the river Vernui. And it is the combination of canal and river that helped create this ecologically unique environment. The uh, water from the river, which has got very few nutrients in it, mm. and then we build a canal out of the local limestone, and it's the mixture of that water which uh, makes a special environment of these plants that are found nowhere else in the world. Yeah. That's why they like the canal. Mm. It's funny, isn't it, when you look back, canals, you know, they were the lifeblood of the Industrial Revolution. Everything was material, everything was mercantile. And now it's back to nature, isn't it? And it's been taken over by the natural things that live on and around the canal. It is. It's given them a new purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have to look after this wildlife quite carefully because yes. it is quite a fragile environment. Yes. Yeah. It's a lovely, lovely spot, lovely place. <laughs> 200 years ago, this canal performed the same function as a motorway does today. Perhaps in two centuries' time, the M1 will have also become a protected nature reserve. Makes you think. Evening is drawing in now, so we're heading back up the Monte to find a mooring before dusk. Prue, however, has other ideas. If we can pull up just by a blackberry bush, I can pick enough for, to make some, well, to make some pudding tonight. You very often see quite a lot of them from the boat because people can't get at them from the towpath. I, I grew up during the war and we, 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 had to, we had to pick blackberries to make jam because of, because of rationing, you know. And ever since, I can't pass a blackberry bush without needing to pick them. No, they're here. Here. No, there. Back! They're there. It, it, lots there. Oh, yeah, masses there. I can see them, but they're out of reach. No, no, this is ridiculous. I do want to be alive to eat them, Tim. This may end in tears. Oh, the frustration. Look at them. Tim! Do you want to come and see if you can you can um, reach these? Yeah, OK. All right, I'll try. When it comes to blackberries, Prue won't be thwarted. No. No. I certainly married the right man, one with a long reach. What do you mean? Well done. Well, that'll have to do for the moment. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I'll make a, make a tiny little pudding. Tiny little pudding? <laughs> Never mind. I might find some more later on. Yeah. When I was little, we used to pick them and, and make jam, like bramble jam. Prue may have trouble remembering what she did last week. OK. But something like picking blackberries brings back clear visions of her childhood. My dad joined up. He was one of the generation that fought in both, both world wars. He was stationed in Minehead, so Ma borrowed a cottage down in Devon. Uh, from, from, from a friend to be near him. It was also to avoid the bombing. During the Blitz, lots of children, like me, were packed off to the countryside. My brother and I went to the local school, and then 
the evacuees arrived with their teacher, Mrs. Prudence, and uh, she taught us our alphabet to the tune of Old Lang Syne. He went A, B, C, D, E, A, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. And there was a terrible middle eight which went, and when the teacher claps her hands quite silent, we must be and sit up nicely in our seats and learn our A, B, C, A, B, C, D. And I was furious and I stormed home and said to my mother, I know my alphabet. <laughs> and eventually she, she took us away from the school and, and then taught us over the kitchen table. <laughs> Those days are long gone, but here on the canals, time moves at a different pace. It brings me closer to my past and the things in my life that really matter. We're on a journey back to the town where we spent our honeymoon 50 years ago. But this morning's conditions are going to make it tougher than we expected. Yeah, not good. Well, whatever the weather you carry on, you know, it's it's um, just part of the part of the part of the exercise, really. Cast off. Okay, skipper. Yep. We're now back on the Llangollen Canal and heading north. We'll face our last set of locks at New Martin. Then we'll wend our way to the Chirk Aqueduct that will carry us into Wales. With luck and the weather on our side, we should reach Chirk Marina before nightfall. But keeping a 60-foot narrow boat travelling in a straight line in this wind is proving very tricky. Oh, come on, blue sky. Sorry, a very difficult corner, that one. Collisions occasionally happen, um, and sometimes it's nobody's fault. Sometimes it is, but uh, you're not going very fast, that's the main thing. Go through one bridge and you come out and you're in different world. It's, uh, it's strange. And the sun's shining, so it's nice. Morning. Wet enough for you. <laughs> it's what I love about, about the canals. You see country life from underneath, you know. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> The Llangollen is popular with boaters because of its rural tranquillity. There are no dark satanic mills on this canal. And also because there are very few locks. The last ones we'll face are here at New Martin. But the weather's on the turn again. It's quite tricky with the wind now. It, uh, we're in a very exposed bit of the canal and uh, we're just waiting for someone to come out of the lock and not get in their way, although we're being blown across their path. I mean, it's not like cars. We don't have boat range. My God, it's cold, isn't it? It's very cold. And the wind! My, my, my poor husband's having problems steering. I need all my 40 years of experience to keep this boat under control. I mean, we go boating in all weathers and, uh, you get used to it. Even in this weather, it's gorgeous, and it has a has a sort of majesty about it. And the, those grey, lowering clouds. 
the two-week package in Benidorm is not for us, really. It's not getting any better, is it? No, it's misery. Pushing on, despite the wind and rain, we're approaching the most celebrated stretch of the St. Gotham Canal. In 2009, this 11-mile section was declared a World Heritage Site and given the same status as the Taj Mahal and the Great Wall of China. Welcome on this lovely afternoon. <laughs> Joining us on board is canal historian Peter Brown, okay. who has agreed to guide us through the first section. OK, Prue, uh, cast off, will you? OK, Tim. Peter knows this canal like the back of his hand. Oh. Certainly a lot better than I do. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's the size of a former bridge. Yes. So, Peter, um, what's interesting about this particular part of the canal? Well, this, this is the World Heritage Site. It's the World Heritage Site because of the superb engineering. Yeah. Two absolutely marvellous aqueducts. Yeah. Uh, Punk the Aqueduct, which is the first major iron structure in the country. Yeah. And, in fact, what's overlooked very often is the embankment leading up to it is probably the biggest earthwork in the country since Silbury Hill was built. Gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What you wouldn't imagine in this lovely rural area is that this was once a coal mining area. Yes. And there was a, a mine down at the bottom built after the canal was built. And in, nine, in 1816, it had tunnelled under the canal. And the canal breached. Luckily, breached on Christmas Day, so it was the only day of the year there weren't any miners down there. Drowned loads of horses, wrecked a lot of equipment. Those poor pit ponies. What a sad story. We are approaching the first of the St. Gotland's two aqueducts. Designed by Thomas Telford, it crosses the Kellyog Valley and takes us out of England and into Wales. Running alongside it, is a viaduct that carries the original Great Western Railway line to Osby Street. And here we are, we're coming up to uh, the, the aqueduct just around the corner, and alongside it is the, the railway. The railway viaduct, yeah. Britain may have the finest canal architecture in the world, but this green and pleasant land is also blessed with some of the world's wettest weather. Just as we emerge out of the shelter of the trees and onto the aqueduct, the storm that's been stalking us all day finds its quarry. You don't need your hat, do you, darling? It just blows off. It's ridiculous. Oh, help. It's hard to admire Thomas Telford's genius when you're cold, wet and miserable. Uh, this is what we were promised. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh yes, this is the stuff. It's soaking. Well, if you come to Wales for a second honeymoon, what do you expect? I wouldn't change a thing. Well, we survived the deluge, and whilst Peter heads home, it's time for us to push on further into Wales. So, we've crossed the border <sighs> from England back to Wales, and uh, about to go through the tunnel. Having overcome the challenge of the valley, the engineer's next obstacle was a steep hill. And this time, Telford's solution was a 400-yard tunnel. Quite frightening, isn't it? What's above us? A, a, a hill. <laughs> um, yes. It's quite, quite tall. Feels like a... A journey through Hades. Yes, it's, oh. it's quite stygian. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, it's so lovely to be out. It feels different being in Wales, doesn't it? The uh, first, first impression. Trees taller, deeper, deeper valley. We're in the Welsh borderlands now, an area fought over for a thousand years. But fortunately, we no longer have to battle the weather. Finally, the Welsh sun appears, 
as we arrive at tonight's mooring, Chirk Marina. Hello, Duckling. Never mind the bad weather. Rain and storms just make moments like this all the sweeter. It's two days into our trip along the Llangollen Canal, and the weather is being kind to us, at least for now. Well, the sun's shining, so let's go. Today, from Chirk Marina, we're heading through the historic landscape of the Offa's Dyke Trail, before crossing the River Dee on the world-famous Ponca Sister Aqueduct. Travelling through the Vale of Flangotlin, we'll arrive at the town itself, hopefully before nightfall. But first, we have to find our way out of the marina. Tim, what's the matter? <laughs> what went wrong? <laughs> it's not like him. <laughs> the men who built this canal back in the early 1800s faced some daunting natural obstacles, but they weren't the first to try to master this area's wild beauty. A thousand years earlier, King Offa built his dike through here, and the area is littered with the ruined castles of forgotten princes. But despite man's best attempts, this landscape remains untamed. Things haven't changed very much, have they, really? That's what's good about canals, isn't it? That you're off the beaten track. It's not like uh, stopping in a lay-by off the M4. It's natural beauty. Reminds me why canals have been so important to us both in a slightly hectic or stressful life, which an actor, actor's life can be. The, the canal is the most wonderful resource. Yeah. Yeah. Canals give us both a chance just to be ourselves away from the spotlight. Cheers. Cheers. I think people have a rather false idea of actors' private lives. They expect you to be kind of madly dramatic and temperamental. And I, I mean, what I love about acting is that it gives me the chance to say things infinitely more intelligent and entertaining than anything I can think of myself. I think people misunderstand how you have to absorb something of the character. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was playing Edward VII, during the lunch hour, I went to boots to get some toothpaste or something under. I suddenly realized that I'd been waiting for someone to open the door for me. <laughs> and a, a, an elderly lady, do you remember? An elderly lady came up and, and did it for me. And I thanked her graciously, but not very warmly. And went out there. Because of course he'd never opened the door for himself in, in No, of course. Oh that poor lady. <laughs> I get asked to play real people, people who have actually existed. It didn't matter whether they were tall, short, fat, young, old, Chinese, anything. Timothy West is the person you want. Wicked people are much more fun to play than good people. When it came to playing Stalin in a really rather brilliant play called Masterclass, it was a delight to play. It doesn't mean you, you play somebody, you condole with all the appalling things that, that he did, but you have to sympathize with him while you're playing it. You have to find the man inside, who is sometimes quite small, quite, um, quite feeble in some ways. Cruz also had a varied career, but one particular character turned her into a household name in the mid-70s. I'm not at all like Sybil, I don't think. When I was a little girl, I knew a lady who had run a hotel with her husband in Eastbourne. And um, so there was a little an element of her in it. But, but as with any part you play, you don't, it, it's very rarely based on one single person. It's sort of bits and bobs that you've collected over the years. 
It was John Cleese and Connie Booth who wrote Forty Towers, but I did have a hand in developing the character of Sybil. I think it was my idea that she fell for his poshness, because he was sort of very public school and sort of officer class and everything, and he fell for her when they met, that she was quite, you know, quite judgy in a barmaid sort of way. Our marriage is nothing like theirs. I can't quite imagine Basil and Sybil making it to their golden wedding. She's more or less made his life a misery, hasn't she? And she got at him a lot, but I, 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 think, she, I think she loved him. Ahead of us lies the vast River Dee Valley. For late 18th century canal engineers, it seemed an almost insurmountable obstacle. But Thomas Telford rose to the challenge, embarking on what was at the time one of the most ambitious and advanced construction projects in the world. At over 300 metres long and nearly 40 metres high, the Ponca Aqueduct is the longest and highest in Britain. It's pretty stupendous, isn't it? Known as the stream in the sky, it is only three and a half metres wide, just enough for a narrow boat and a towpath, with a railing on one side only. I mean, looked at you from this angle, you, you, you look to be just flying over nothing. Not much fun if, like me, you're afraid of heights. How does it make you feel? Terrified. You don't like it. No. <laughs> Whether ever railings, because there are holes there. No, no, never, no. never, never any railing on that side. And Nothing. On this side Just at all. Except the, the edge of the trough. There's never been an incident of a boat jumping over the edge. Or a passenger. Or well, passengers, I'm sure, have. Yes. The narrow width enabled Telford to create a lean and elegant structure using what was, at the time, state-of-the-art building materials. The mortar which uh, fixed the, uh, the stone and the, and, and the iron together was made of boiling Welsh flannel with sugar, uh, and it was mixed with uh, ox blood. Just what I wanted to be told when we we're only halfway across. It's still as strong as it was in 1805. Yeah. We're high above country that is steeped in medieval history. It was here that the Welsh revolted against the English in the 14th century, led by Owain Glyndor. And the River Dee, the birthplace of Owain Glyndor, of whom Shakespeare wrote in Henry IV, part That's one. Right, yes. At my nativity, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes, of burning cressets, and at my birth, the frame and huge foundation of the earth shaked like a coward. I want to fling myself onto the top of those trees and bounce. <laughs> yeah. I won't, I promise. No, please don't. <laughs> like the plays of Shakespeare, this aqueduct is a work of creative genius. It's a symbol of the might of the industrial age and a thing of great beauty that fits perfectly into this landscape. Even so, I'm glad we've made it over to the other side. Here the landscape changes once again. One minute the Welsh hills tower above us, the next we're surrounded by ancient woodlands. Doesn't look like a proper canal anymore, does it? It looks like a little stream running down the bottom of somebody's garden. But it's so beautiful. We've entered the land of Celtic myth and legend. High up in Castaldinas Bran, there once lived the beautiful Princess Mivanwy, who broke the heart of a young Welsh bard. The tragic howl endlessly haunts the forest, playing a lament for his lost love. Well, unless we want to bump into the ghost of Howell, we'd better press on. Night is falling fast. Evening now, the sun's dropping, and uh, people are thinking about going to bed, like those kids there in their tent. 
Finally, through the trees, we catch a glimpse of our destination. Now we're coming into Llangollen, and it's a lovely, calm evening. For Prue and me, this place is very special. We came here as newlyweds 50 years ago. Will we get a mooring? I think so. Yeah. Well, it's not a bad way to finish the day, is it? Just made it. After such a long day on the canal, it's time to relax with the crossword. Young family members eaten the whole salad plant. Eight. It seems appropriate. As many moons ago, it was the crossword that brought us together, and we are at our honeymoon destination. Eaten the whole salad. Plant. Shall we do the quickie? <laughs> Morning in the Welsh hill town of Llangollen. We stayed here on our honeymoon, and 50 years on, it's still as charming as ever. In fact, it has been attracting tourists since the early 19th century, when both the poet Wordsworth and the Duke of Wellington were regular visitors. Since our honeymoon, one thing has changed. The old Great Western Railway line, which was axed in the mid-60s, has been partially restored. So, before we complete the final section of the canal, I'm allowing Tim to indulge in a passion he's had since childhood. Steam trains. A lot of canal anoraks are also steam anoraks, and um, I'm both. You're both, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to be here the, on the Vlachagafen Railway and see that they've preserved the integrity of the Great Western. The engine is, is a Great Western locomotive. The coat is a great western, and um, I'm very much looking forward to a ride. The original line linked the towns of Rewaven to the east with Barmouth on the west coast. The restored Llancotland Railway is a nine-and-a-half-mile section of the original 50-mile route. Tea and homemade scones. This is how oh, it should be. Magic. OK. Uh, well, we've well, got one each, actually. That's brilliant. This is how it used to be, you see. Like paradise, isn't it? Steam trains view and tea and homemade scones. I mean... There's the D. Oh, yes. Look. Oh, I was what they now call a train spotter. I've had a, um, a railway passion longer than canals, because I knew about them much earlier. Steam railways, of course, um, unfortunately, were one of the major factors in um, the closure of um, many canals. They saw them as competition, and uh, the best way of dealing with the competition was to take them over, run them down, make sure that they were inoperative or difficult, uh, and um, take their custom. The arrival of the train may have spelt the end for the commercial canal network, but the same national instinct to save Britain's branch lines also inspired the restoration of canals. These once bitter rivals are now both acknowledged as vital parts of our heritage. We've reached the last station on the line, and for Tim, a boyhood dream is about to come true. Now I've had my scones and jam, and this is my big treat. Right, going on the engine. Hello. 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 Hello, Graham. Hello. Ah. We're getting ready to go. Yeah. Do, would you like to put a little bit of coal? I'm working on. I'll so again, not you. not too much on the shovel. That's right. Round and just in in the door. What are they paying you for? Door. Oh. 
see how far we get. To return to St. Gotland, the engine needs to run round and reverse, leaving me, Paul the stoker, and Graham the driver at the mercy of the elements. This is, this is really exciting. We're going to the head of the train, tender first, nothing there except a heap of coal and the world, and a lot of rain <coughs> and wind and a bit of but it's wonderful. Prue and I have been cruising at no more than four miles an hour for several days, so this feels like we're rocketing along. Yeah, great. Right. I love it. Against the speed of the steam train, the slow and steady canal barge stood no chance. Despite this, much of the commercial network limped on until the harsh winter of 1963, when all the canals froze over and sealed the end of a way of life that had lasted for over two centuries. The San Gotland Canal gives us a rare chance to see the pioneering genius of canal and railway engineering working side by side. There's something romantic about a steam-filled platform, even if you've been married for 50 years. That's exciting. It was very exciting indeed, yes. Yes, it's lovely. Yeah. Thanks, fellas. Bye-bye. All the best. Thank you. Made it day. Made it here. It's time for the last leg of our journey to the very source of the canal. From Llangothland Wharf, we'll travel the four miles to another of Thomas Telford's great engineering triumphs, the Horseshoe Falls. This section of the canal is too shallow for our own vessel, so we're stepping even further back in time and taking a horse-drawn boat. Hello, good to Hi. see you. Can we say we hello to Tav? Yeah, of course you can, yeah. Hello, hello. Tav. He's, he's friendly enough. Hello, Tav. Every day, whatever the weather, Taff and Fran take the same journey the boatmen and their horses have taken since this stretch of the canal opened in the early 19th century. The thing I like most about it is that it's so quiet and yeah. no yeah. engine sound. Absolutely, yeah. No yeah. engine yeah. sound. We've got no engine rumbling underneath the feet. Yeah. Fran is doing exactly what the old boatman would have done back in Georgian times. The horse won't fit under the bridge, so she's <laughs> having to uh, let, let him go over the top and thread the line through on her, herself from underneath. Oh, poor Taff. What a day for him. I don't think Taff minds so much, but uh, Fran must be getting oh, fed yeah. up, I would have thought. This tourist attraction has been around a lot longer than you might think. The company's actually been running since 1884, started by a chap called Captain Jones. Carry the boats. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, it's all Joneses, isn't it? Yes. Once in charge of an ocean liner, the retired Captain Jones saw an opportunity in St. Gotland's growing tourist trade. He acquired two horses and two former lifeboats and began transporting Victorian ladies and gentlemen up to see the falls. Lovely here, being absolutely on your own. Yes. As we get higher up the canal, it becomes too shallow even for this boat. So I say goodbye to Taff. Thank you, Taff. Thank you very much. We have to walk the final stretch to the falls. And even though it's cold and wet, it's well worth the trip. Pretty little spot. Absolutely amazing. What a vision. Absolutely. In 1830, Telford designed a 140-metre weir, 
to raise the river level by three feet, ensuring that the canal is supplied with 10 million gallons of water a day, which in turn feeds so much of the canal network. Considering they were driven by hard-nosed businessmen, yeah, yeah, uh, they managed to do it all without screwing up the countryside. Absolutely, yeah. When I heard about this, I thought it was going to be a natural phenomenon. Now I see that it's a, yes. a, a piece of engineering. It's absolutely staggering. It's fitting that our journey ends at the place that brings life to this entire canal network. It may no longer hum with the sound of barges carrying coal and slate, but thanks to Telford's engineering marvels, the San Gothlin has been reborn as a place of outstanding natural beauty. The weather has done its worst, but given a choice between a second honeymoon on this canal and a trip to the Caribbean, it'll be San Gothlin every time. It's a journey and a town that's close to our hearts. In 1963, we came here in love's first bloom. Fifty years later, we're still together, and it's great to be back. Well, not a bad place to finish the day, is it? It's a bit cold. Yes. So what about some supper? Okay. Next week, we head across the channel. Cast off, please. Aye, aye, sir. To visit a canal that runs through the heart of rural Burgundy, enjoying fabulous food and wine. I've swallowed mine. You don't have to apologise. Spending precious time with our family. It's yeah. Joe. It is, it is. <laughs> mm. At the same time next Monday, and if you've been affected by the issues featured in the programme, there's support available at channel4.com forward slash support. Coming up next this evening, we're at the tricky toddler training stage in One Born, What Happened Next? <laughs>